let's cut the earth in half you can see all of its layers here's the inter core it's about 40 times hotter than the inside of your oven that's the mantle and ocean of hot lava here comes the crust of the earth the solid surface on which our civilization lives but if you look up there are many layers besides the atmosphere and the ozone layer scientists recently discovered a strange bubble here which protects our planet from radiation and nope it's not the earth's magnetic field this bubble is is made of radio waves our planet grows like a christmas tree in the radio spectrum but we're interested in low frequency waves the ones that let us keep in touch with submarines so radio waves are like light waves or regular ocean waves look at this one the distance between the two peaks is the wavelength and the number of these waves over a period of time is the frequency for example there are 10 waves in this interval of one second so can you guess the frequency of this wave yep it's 10 hertz cell phones use waves with a frequency of 300 to 3000 mas so add six more zeros to that number but waves of that frequency don't penetrate barriers well think of how you lose your cell phone connection when you're driving through a tunnel that's because there is metal inside it's a conductive material that weakens the radio waves a lot salt water is also a kind of conductor so if the submarine is deep enough the thick layer of water weakens the signal and we lose communication too Maintain it we send fewer waves, but make them longer in the same amount of time the frequency of the short waves will be. Much higher than the frequency of the long waves that's why they're called very low frequency waves, but as it turns. Out these waves travel all over the earth and even into space this is where things get interesting the waves collide. With particles of radiation from the sun we think of the sun as a friendly giant giving us light and heat, but it actually emits a lot of harm and full radiation each flare or the electrical discharge of material on our home star causes an even greater burst of radiation these particles fly to our planet just as radio waves do they travel 93 million mil from the sun to earth in eight minutes and crash into our bubble which acts as a shield basically radiation particles from the sun accumulate in the radiation belts around the earth our planet's magnetic field traps them and a recently discovered bubble of very low frequency waves lies right below this radiation belt it helps us repel some of the harmful emissions analysis of old studies confirmed that the radiation belts used to be much lower and closer to earth but when our civilization began to use radio Actively, our waves raised that belt higher no one expected such an effect from simple radio waves but it'll give us a way to protect astronauts in the future when you're on Earth its magnetic field keeps you safe from radiation. You can physically see it when charged solar wind particles make the air particles at the poles of our planet. Glow this is an aurora next time you admire this beauty know that it's actually the Earth saving you from some extremely harmful rays but if you're outside the Earth's magnetic field somewhere in space I have bad news for. You nothing protects you there this is a big problem for astronauts who spend months on the International Space Station perhaps scientists will learn to create protective bubbles of very low frequency waves around space stations and spacecraft the same is true for other planets were probably going to colonize Mars there is no magnetic field there and nothing can protect you from radiation but if you create an artificial bubble there you can reduce the harmful radiation another invisible bubble protecting us is the atmosphere it's like a layer cake or an onion each level of the atmosphere has its own properties the lowest layer that we live in is the troposphere this layer contains 80 percent of the weight of all the air on the planet it's also the main place where water vapor lives and this is where the machine called weather works the sun sends rays of energy to the earth our planet surface reflects them and heats the air in the troposphere this makes it move and change places with the cold air so all the wind cyclone storms and tornadoes only happen in the troposphere up to about 7.5 m high that's why commercial planes fly at an altitude of around 6 miles the wind or other bad weather conditions hardly affect this area and the air here is not as dense as it is down on earth flying one mile above sea level is like moving through a biscuit it's hard but at a 6 m altitude flying feels like moving through light whipped cream the plane almost feels no resistance so it's a win-win they save fuel and keep the passengers music safe a couple of significant downsides are that it's very cold and you can't breathe there it's cold because there 
are very few air molecules to absorb heat from the ground and transfer it to each other you wouldn't be able to. Breathe here for the same reason that's why planes are equipped with oxygen masks just in case let's go a little. Here this is the stratosphere there's even fewer air molecules up here and that's where the weather probes fly. They're the kind of small balloons with computers people use to predict the weather this part of the atmosphere also. Contains the well-known ozone layer this is our shield against harmful ultraviolet radiation ozone is almost. The same as oxygen except it has three atoms in it when harmful ultraviolet. Rays enter our atmosphere they crash into the O3 molecule the ray breaks the molecule into O2 and another oxygen atom the ray itself is converted into heat. But the ozone regenerates quickly a single oxygen atom joins the O2 and the ozone molecule is ready to protect us again it's the invisible shield that protects us from radiation it gave birth to all life on earth as our civilization developed we started to emit freon gas into the atmosphere we used to fill our old refrigerators with it a single chlorine atom would detach from a freon molecule when in the air and then it would bind a single oxygen atom now the ozone can't regenerate like it used to fortunately we banned the use of such harmful gases and the ozone layer began to regenerate scientists expect it to fully recover in the middle of the 21st century imagine flying in a spacecraft in a cloud of asteroids at high speed you dodge one one more and then hit the gas pedal to the floor and crash into an asteroid at full speed on purpose this is exactly what nasa is going to do in the near future the entire mission will begin at vandenberg air force base in california on november 24th let's follow it's step by step so the falcon 9 booster rocket is already on the launch pad it's as tall as a 22-story building or 11 giraffes and it can get about 8 tons of cargo into orbit so you could send a big elephant into space and a supply of food for it countdown 3 2 1 ignition smoke clouds everywhere and the rocket begins to gain altitude 9 engines are working at full power to accelerate the Rocket at its peak it reaches speeds 10 times faster than the speed of sound and then the rocket engine shut down and the rocket's first stage undocks to return to Earth a couple of seconds. Later the second stage receives the ignition command it turns on its one engine and climbs even higher to orbit. The cargo capsule then opens and releases the DART spacecraft DART stands. For double asteroid redirection test once released the spaceship deploys too large solar panels it'll convert solar energy into electrical energy to power a revolutionary ion engine conventional engines create thrust by burning tons of fuel and ejecting it outward the rocket itself is essentially pushing off the emitted gases the ion engine will not burn fuel it'll use a strong electric field to accelerate the ionized gas like conventional rockets it'll eject this gas and create thrust by repelling it and though the ion engine produces less thrust it can accelerate the spacecraft to higher speeds so regular rocket engines have an excellent performance on the road they push the pedal to the metal burning a bunch of fuel while the ion engine slowly accelerates but when a conventional rocket needs to make a refueling stop the ion spacecraft will was past the regular one at insane speeds so the dark spacecraft begins its year-long journey by comparison of flight to mars would take about seven months f fast forward one year ahead and we've arrived this is the asteroid deimos the far point of its orbit is two astronomical units from our star that's two earth sun distances at this point the sun begins to pull the asteroid back and then it approaches the closest point to the star one earth sun distance that is its orbit lies very close to the orbit of our planet Didymos made its closest approach to Earth at a distance of about 4.8 million mil that's 20 times farther than the moon's orbit it takes 770 days to complete one such revolution around the sun so Deimos is not considered a hazardous asteroid but in the future it'll approach the Earth even closer and the consequences of a collision with it could be catastrophic given its size it's bigger than two empire state buildings and it rotates at a rate of one revolution in two hours and 15 minutes so it has a tremendous amount of energy plus it has an asteroid companion it's a small pebble 520 feet wide it's like 12 school buses or 10 train cars its orbital period that is the time it takes the pebble to make a complete circle 
around the asteroid is about 11.9 hours NASA believes that asteroids up to 80 feet wide are likely to burn up completely in our atmosphere due to friction with the air so they're not hazardous asteroids. Between 80 feet and half a mile in size will not burn completely and could cause severe damage and asteroids over half a mile have the potential to wipe out large cities or even entire states in. That sense we can consider Dido's potentially hazardous so we're going to test one way of defending against. Asteroids on a kinetic impact that's why we sent DART here so our spacecraft is going to hit an asteroid only not its main body but its little companion DART is already moving toward it at about 4 meters per second at that speed a trip from New York to Washington DC would take less than a minute and a trip across the United States from coast to coast would take about 10 minutes DART is getting close 3 seconds to impact 2-1 BAM the spacecraft crashes into the asteroid at full speed where your prediction's asteroid explodes and is blown to pieces or asteroid flies off the main body into space like a billiard ball while scientists predict that this collision will reduce the speed of this small asteroid by a fraction of a percent but it'll still be enough to reduce its orbital period by a few minutes then our telescopes on earth will be able to study the effects of the collision in more detail and to learn even more we'll send another spacecraft to did on another mission this is hera it'll be launched in 2024 and is scheduled to arrive at demos around 2027 this spacecraft will carry a bunch of research equipment to assess the collision damage done by dart when it arrives hara will take many pictures of the small asteroid including a fresh impact crater hera will also be carrying two cube sats these are miniature space probes smaller than a shoe box it'll launch these mini satellites and they will make an even closer approach to the asteroid they will study this space rock for three to six months at the end of the mission one of them will attempt to land on the asteroid surface to learn even more about its composition and internal structure it's also possible Hera will carry a mini impactor this thing will have to make another impact on the asteroid then scientists will be able to Evaluate the difference in impacts with a large spacecraft and a small one and understand how we can defend against asteroids in the future all aboard this is the intergalactic cruiser the destination on. Your ticket is a tour of the local group of galaxies featuring the large and small melanic galaxies the Orion Nebula the In Andromeda and Triangulum galaxies and a few surprises in between tickets please be advised you may. Experience a slight tingling sensation as we rev into hyperspace the ship and everything in it is going through a dimensional phase change it's nothing to worry about the tingling passes. Quickly now passengers as we head toward galactic latitude 180 degrees north as terrarians are accustomed to calling it our first main item of interest will be an intense star forming region known as M42 the Orion Nebula but first a Special treat by the captain that's not on the advertised itinerary, the HSE head. Nebula it's off to the port side that's left for you Wajis its designation is. M43 the newborn star at the top of the horse's head has a strong solar wind. That is deforming the shape of the nebular cloud get a good look at it now. Because in a few thousand years those gases will be completely blown away by the star-like nebula that made our sun. Yep long gone except for the nebular gases captured by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus. And Neptune okay now one of our junior explorers asks a question what is the M? In M42 and M43 well young lady the M stands for Messier pronounce Messier not. Messier as in is your room Messier then M Charles Messier I mean Messier to be. Precise was a French astronomer in the 18th century he published a catalog of. 110 fuzzy objects as seen through an early telescope the HSE head nebula is. Number 43 on his list we'll see more M's as we continue our. Tour heads up we're coming to the Orion nebula the gases in the nebula may seem. Less colorful than you expect that's because we're accustomed to the seeing long exposure telescopic photos and. Enhanced photos designed to highlight the different gases in the nebula may I suggest using the pair of tinted glasses. That come with your onboarding packet if you want to heighten your experience and we go now it's a good. 
thing we are in hyperspace as we approach the trapezium star cluster in the center the bright star Theta C sends. Out a solar wind at 5 million miles per hour it sculpts the whole cloud of gas. And dust creating shock waves that compress nearby stars Theta C is a megastar 200,000. Times brighter than the sun it will go supernova in about a million years I. Won't be around that oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur glow in ionized states like A. Fluorescent light bulb oxygen, blue hydrogen, red some green and sulfur and. Dust glow as yellow-orange as we pull out of the Orion Nebula and rise high above the galactic. Plain the spiral arms of the Milky Way are visible our sun which you cannot. Distinguish from this height above the galaxy is in the Orion spur that lies between the outer Perseus arm and the. Inner Sagittarius arm notice the center of the Milky Way contains a bright magnetic bar that plays an essential part in star formation over 70% of nearby galaxies. Include magnetic bars it's a sign of a mature galaxy only 20% of distant. Galaxies contain magnetic bars in their cores which reminds me passengers the juice bar is now open our H1 server will. Take your orders now that's the Anroma galaxy far far out to the port side, but may I call your attention to the many dwarf galaxies, over 40 of them that populate our galactic neighborhood we're heading. To one now the large melanic cloud LMC to astronomers is an irregular dwarf. Satellite galaxy of the Milky Way containing about 30 billion stars with a dynamic star forming region called the Tarantula Nebula which we will be cruising through shortly of course if there is a large Magellan Cloud there must be a small Magellan Cloud SMC, and there it is below. And to the left of the LMC the Milky Way will eventually ingest both dwarf galaxies some prefer the word accreted but the result is the same if you use your tinted glasses again you can see that the LMC has stripped away a tremendous amount of gas from the SMC as they have interacted gravitationally over millions of years hey I know all about gas now we're heading out of the Milky Way to a Distance of about 50 kiloparex, that's 50,000 parks, or about 163,000 light years. So what's a parek? No, it's not slang for pair of socks. A parek is about 3.26 light years. A light year is about 5.88 trillion miles. The word parsec is a combination of two. Words parallax and second parallax is the shift an object seems to make when. Viewed from two different perspectives, looking at an object with your left eye, and then your right eye. You'll see the object appear as shift that's parallax when an astronomical object is photographed with the Earth on one side of the Sun and then again six months later on the other side of the Sun the shift is measurable in degrees of arc or minutes of arc or seconds of arc down to milliseconds of arc that's a par sec a parallax of one arc second which turns out to be 3.26 light year hey what about a john of arc that's how you measure Distances in France, how huh? meanwhile, since you can't measure a light year with a ruler or a tape measure, parex are the scientific way of telling the distance to a star or intergalactic object. The greater the parallax, the closer the object is, the smaller the parallax, the farther away it is. Now, straight ahead in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula is the R136 star cluster. Within a distance of one light year, there are over 40 stars each. With a mass over 50 tons that of the sun while you may think the earth is pretty big but the sun makes up almost 99.9% .9 of the mass of the whole solar system the rest of the mass is made up by the planets and their satellites asteroids comets gas and dust it's around 93 million mil away from our planet but it keeps us warm every day. Its temperature is about 10,000 to F, but the space surrounding it is still cold as ice. To understand this we need to distinguish between heat and temperature. Heat is the energy inside. Some object temperature is something that tells us if that object is hot or cold. When the heat is transferred to that object it makes its temperature go up. When the object is losing heat the temperature goes down. Heat can be transferred in three different ways. The sun does it through radiation that means. It's releasing heat in the form of light your body radiates heat too as infrared. Waves that's why thermal imaging cameras will detect that you're in the room even at night the hotter the object the more. Heat it will radiate the temperature only affects matter since space is mostly a vacuum it doesn't have enough. 
particles for heat to transfer in any other way than through radiation when the heat from the sun gets to an object. The atoms start absorbing energy but the heat can't transfer since there's no matter in space those those rare atoms. And molecules in space will absorb the heat and they'll simply stay that way. While the cold vacuum will stay cold there's a lot of matter inside Earth's atmosphere so the energy of the sun can transfer easily but if you put an object outside of the Earth's atmosphere in direct sunlight it would end up heated to 250 degrees Fahrenheit because it's matter made of atoms and molecules the temperature of the vacuum is 454 degrees Fahrenheit that means depending on where you are space can either burn or freeze you the sun isn't actually yellow it emits light over a wide range of wavelengths we can tell both its temperature and color by the peak in its Spectrum for instance cooler stars will appear red and hotter stars will be blue. With yellow, orange and white stars in between when it comes to the sun the spectrum peaks at a wavelength we'd use usually call green but our eye perceives it differently so the shade of green in combination with other wavelengths from the spectrum is going to look white to the human eye we generally see the sun as yellow because our atmosphere scatters blue light more efficiently than the red one during sunrise end. Sunset there's more red light in the spectrum of the sun which gives us amazing scenery sunspots are part of the sun's visible surface that are on average way cooler than the sun itself they overlap with parts that have an increased magnetic field these parts don't allow the release of heat to the sun's visible surface that way the rest of the sun's surface is three times brighter than those sunspots that contrast makes them appear almost black if we could take a sunspot Apart from the sun and place it somewhere in the night sky it would be different as bright as the moon when we see it from the earth all the planets in our solar system spin in the same direction because they were formed from one protoplanetary cloud except for Uranus and Venus they have probably had some strong impact on them that made them spin in the opposite direction but it's different with galaxies they don't usually form the same cloud of dust and particles also they're not randomly distributed across space they come in filaments dense slender strands of dark matter and galaxies with voids in between proto galaxies are linked by gravitational forces in small areas of space this is probably because of the distribution of dark matter throughout the universe the matter in the filaments moves in a corkscrew motion and goes towards the densest area so there might be a common direction galaxies tend to spin but it's mostly random there's a possibility we'll see a lunar elevator one day yep a cable anchored to the surface of the moon it would stretch to 250,000 miles we wouldn't be able to directly attach it to our planet because both earth and the moon are moving but we could keep it terminated high in our planet's orbit some researchers believe we could build such an elevator for a few billion dollars the moon has resources we could definitely use a rare form of helium found there could be of use in fusion power stations on our planet also we could take some other rare elements and use them in smartphones and the rest of electronics so after around 53 trips up and down the elevator could pay for itself the cable would be as thick as a pencil but its weight would be around 40 tons it could even be made of materials we already have here on Earth with no need to invent something there could even be a combination of two. Elevators a spacecraft would winch up an elevator from the surface of our planet to a space station. Then it would be flung towards the moon there would be another elevator to finally lower it down to the surface of. The moon that's one small step for man one giant leap for mankind something. Neil Armstrong the first human that set foot on the surface of the moon said he was there with Buzz Aldrin spending too and half hours on the lunar surface preparation for this project took a couple of years and all the equipment the astronauts carried weighed over 170 pounds it wasn't easy to land on the moon there were lots of attempts in history that ended in failure for example astronauts in one of the apollo programs had enough fuel to rocket people to the lunar surface in a mere three days but they wanted to save on fuel so it took them over a month to get there there's no GPS to tell you where exactly to land the spacecraft travels fast and it has to slow down in a vacuum with not enough information but since 1969 12 people have already walked there the moon is the only space object humans have visited so far the rest have only been visited by robots but all these people were just there for a short visit NASA 
announced their program to work on a permanent presence on the moon that would help scientific research and could be a good point to learn how to do the same on other missions like the one on Mars. Imagine being the 13th person going to the moon's scary silence, moon dust under your feet, feet and nothing but an endless black sky with stars all over. You but you have no time to admire the view there are many issues you'd need to figure out before landing first of all. Our bodies are like machines that are adapted to conditions on earth like gravity atmosphere the air we breathe. And the food we eat our planet is where we function optimally our gravity is six. Times stronger than on the moon which is compared to our planet almost a vacuum. Whatever you do it wouldn't be smart to hold your breath in such conditions the vacuum would pull the air from your body. Oxygen still present in your body would expand together with bodily fluids they would push against the blood vessels and organ tissues your body legs and arms. They would all lose their current shape and would bloat like a balloon to twice their normal size if you stayed like that for a longer time you wouldn't survive but you wouldn't explode your skin is pretty elastic and it would hold your body together liquids that are exposed to your body would evaporate the surface of your eyes and skin it would all boil saliva would literally boil on your tongue but the blood would still be liquid the walls of the vessels would protect it from boiling no atmosphere no oxygen either the oxygen that's already in your lungs would quickly be gone and you'd have nothing to breathe in if your organs stopped getting oxygen usually delivered to different parts of your body body by blood you'd pass out because your brain would shut down it would happen in the first 15 seconds that's how much time your body has to Use the remaining oxygen in the blood to keep the brain functioning stay like that for a longer time and bye bye now. Ozone layer no strong magnetic field the atmosphere of the moon is similar in density to those uppermost layers of the Earth's atmosphere where we have the International Space Station that means your body would be exposed to all those dangerous ionizing radiations from outer space we can't feel now because layers surrounding Earth keep us safe on Earth. Our muscles and bones are tuned to resist gravitational force without gravity we'd start losing muscles and our bones would become weaker it's like with the blobfish a marine creature that looks like the saddest animal on earth this fish lives deep down in the ocean when down there it looks like most other fish just slightly scarier but when when it's out in the fresh air it becomes flat and its entire body looks like some weird sad pudding all due to differences in pressure the moon would Make you look like a blobfish because of drastic changes in atmospheric pressure there's no pressure that would hold your body together while on earth a column of air presses an approximate mass of 15 to 20 tons on the entire surface of your body we don't notice this because this air pillar presses the body equally from all sides there's air inside your body too internal pressure is the same as the atmosphere and on the lunar surface there's no pressure from outside to back it up it's also really cold up there. Temperature drastically changes from 250 degrees Fahrenheit during the day to minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit when it's night a day on the moon lasts 29 Earth days that means you'd be spending 14 and a half days in unbearable light and the next 14 and a half a days in scary cosmic darkness your body could eventually freeze solid if it's nighttime the same as in other places in space depending on where exactly you're at this would happen within 12 to 26 hours, or if you visited the moon during just one regular afternoon you'd be burnt to a crisp it's better to do what Apollo 11 did and come at dawn so you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad and well you don't have to falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship you have to choose a bigger black hole to survive if you fall into a small black hole its event horizon is too narrow and the gravity increases every inch down so if you extend your arm forward the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow this will make your hand lengthen and you'll feel some discomfort rather significant to be honest things change if you fall into a super massive black hole like the ones in the center of galaxies they can be millions of times heavier than our sun there Event horizon is wide and gravity doesn't change as quickly so the forest you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same and you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole this myth is busted the next myth claims we can save the earth from a giant asteroid with a big bam the familiar plot is that a spaceship lands on the surface of an asteroid a team of astronauts quickly 
drills a hole and it leaves a present there and flies away then bam is a. Result the asteroid may break into several pieces and continue on its way to Earth while big chunks of the asteroid fall to our surface causing a lot of damage so our mission has failed well to save Earth we need a really big bam not only outside the asteroid but right above its surface when the boom happens the force of the blast pushes the asteroid slightly downward even a slight Change in trajectory would be enough to make the asteroid fly past the Earth in the future done oh, and if you made a big boom on an asteroid you'd never be able to hear its loud sound yeah we often hear the sound of spaceships in battle. In space in the movies but that's just a myth sound is a wave that spreads. Because of the vibrations of molecules a person claps a few feet away from you. The sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap then the third fourth and so on until the wave reaches your ear so to spread sound we need molecules like air or water in our atmosphere sound waves spread out just fine but space is a vacuum so it's nothing here you can clap your hands loudly there but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound one more myth about asteroids we need to fly a little farther than mars's orbit woo we're in an asteroid belt and we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice we got in some dense asteroid Cloud not true the fact is that space is huge and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon so there really aren't that many of them there to understand the size of the emptiness in space look at the collision. Of two galaxies there are billions of stars in each of them if we mix them up. To see what the on eye in the night sky but its system hides a little secret. Let's fly there and take a closer look so here's this red dwarf at 7 times smaller than our sun and 8 times lighter Proxima Centauri is 1.5 times bigger than Jupiter and almost 150 times heavier but what we're looking for is a little further away this is Proxima. Centauri be a planet similar to Earth it's only 10% larger than Earth and is in the habitable zone of the star it's the perfect distance not too far away and not too close so the temperature isn't too high or low there either water if it exists on that planet can be in a liquid state and so life can survive and evolve there maybe it's developed enough to send us the signal that we had received a radio signal is basically waves they have a certain frequency and length and we can always tell an artificial signal from a naturally generated one the signal that we picked up from Proxima Centauri B had a frequency of 982 megahertz the Regular radio we listen to in the kitchen or in the car picks up signals around 100 MHz that's why scientists have concluded that the signal was created artificially such signals could have a way of communication between the developed worlds if this is really a message from an outer space civilian we should be able to decode it for this any civilization must use the simplest method of encryption for example Earth has already sent a radio signal into Space it was the OSPO message this message consists of 1,679 digits it's a rectangle of 23x73 squares that has information about our civilization encoded using a binary code at the top of the rectangle there's a system of numbers that we use they're marked in white this purple thing is the key to read the next part of the message. The atomic numbers of the elements like hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus are encoded in this key. These are the key elements that can start life if those who receive this signal can make sense of the numbers in the key. They can read the next part of the message. These green things are the building blocks of our DNA chain and right at the bottom here is the DNA chain itself. The white rectangle indicates the number of pairs of these. Building blocks in the blue spiral show the shape of a DNA chain and then we see the human silhouette itself the white and blue object to its left is a coded number of our average height the human itself is drawn here here at the ends of the DNA strand so that the outer space civilization can understand what we look like in the white rectangle too. The right of the human sketch is the number of Earth's population at the time of the message that's 4.2 billion as of. 1974 almost half the number we have now the next part is a drawing of our solar system the big yellow square is the sun then come all the planets in our solar system including Pluto Earth is shifted up a bit here so that outer space civilization can understand where this message is coming from in the last 
drawing is the observatory from which this message had been sent into space. This signal is now on its way to the M13. Star cluster 25,000 light years away from Earth, so it won't get there for another 25,000 years, and will need another 25 to get a response if there's really someone on the other side who can receive the signal if the signal from Proxima Centauri is also a message, we'll need time to decode it, so let's fire up our superpower powered computing machine and wait for the result, but this isn't the first mystery signal we've ever picked up on Earth scientists recorded an unusual WOW signal in 1977. They supposed it came from somewhere in the constellation of Sagittarius the telescope was picking up the unknown. Signal for an impressive 72 seconds later a scientist who looked at the print out of the signal concluded that the signal was artificial he wrote WOW on the print out as his reaction the following observations and Studies couldn't catch the signal again some theories said that this signal came from a celestial spaceship flying by it. Had flown away and we could no longer detect the signal but most likely this signal was created on Earth it was. Directed upward but reflected off an object at a high altitude it could have been an airplane a satellite or space. Debris orbiting our planet then the signal was picked up by the telescope and because it was human made all of its. Characteristics like wavelength and frequency could have confused scientists, that's it. For today, so hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends, or if you. It's unlikely there will be any collisions, even here. Another myth is that there's zero gravity in our orbit. Imagine you're in a huge box 10 miles up in the air. Now we let go of the box and it starts to fall. You're falling simultaneously with a box at the same speed and now it's as if you feel zero gravity well the same thing happens in orbit the international space station is 250 miles above the earth and it's falling continuously though not on the surface of the planet but around it in its orbit its speed at this point is about 4.7 m slash second it could cross the united states from the west coast to the east coast in just eight minutes so the astronauts there are experiencing the same thing they're just falling with. The ISS at that speed now let's look at the moon it always looks at us with one. Side this means the moon has a dark side and the sun's rays never get there well. That's a myth the whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the earth there are days and nights. There too it's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the earth so whenever you look at the Moon you only see one side although there are days when the sun shines there. Two so it's not the dark side it's the far side and we even have pictures of this place and there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system the South Pole Ain Basin it's as. Why does two states of Texas one myth that turned out to be untrue is that. People have never actually been on the moon this is the or spacet of the first. Astronauts who either look at the sole of the shoe some people claim there's no way they could have left. Footprints like this there actually they could on the moon the astronauts wore. Extra boots over their suits and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly the astronauts didn't grab. Then when they left the moon they left a lot of stuff there too they even ripped out the armrests of the seats of the lunar module to reduce its weight now the total weight of human trash on the moon is about 187 tons including several lunar rovers spacecraft debris rocket stages and lunar probes that's like three boeing 737s the next myth is about summer the hot season comes because the earth approaches the closest distance to the sun in a year the sun warms our planet more and we all have to go to the beach well not true let's draw an axis through our planet it's slightly tilted on one side and winter comes when our planet's axis is tilted away from the sun but over time the axis tilts toward the hot star then its rays shine at such an angle that it gets warmer it's true. Though that the earth happens to be at a different distances from the sun this is because our orbit is not a perfect circle but slightly flattened an ellipse normally we think of the distance to our Star is about 93 3 million miles, but that distance may be longer or shorter than 3 million miles depending on which point in our orbit we pass another myth. About the sun is that it's yellow well let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and it's white the sun only appears yellow to us. Through the filter of our atmosphere the composition of the air and its thickness. 
just distorts the light of the star, but stars do come in different colors cooler. Stars have bright orange and red colors these are usually very old stars older than our sun but young and very hot stars are bright blue the sun is about. In the middle of the spectrum thousands of strange spaceships sneak into Earth's airspace they descend to our planet and fly through cities plunging people into complete chaos suddenly the door of the largest ship opens and a strange creature comes out it tries to copy our language and says they had come from from a distant star Proxima Centauri something like this might happen because scientists have recently picked up a strange radio signal off that star Proxima Centaur is the closest star to our solar system it's only 4.2 light. Years away that means a beam of light that starts from this star reaches Earth in 4.2 years that's also 270,000. Distances from Earth to the Sun the star Proxima Centaur itself is too pale for us.